انك لا تهدي من احببت ولكن الله يهدي من يشاء Assalamu alaikum to lies John Fontaine just before we begin the podcast please make sure you click subscribe and also set your notifications please support on the Patreon account Jazakallah khair assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim alhamdulillah rabbil alamin wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi welcome to the Young Smith podcast it's me John Fontaine and joined by Sheikh Yahya assalamu alaikum Sheikh assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh we share the same name Aha, uh-huh. you know John, John Yahya. Yahya, of course. Did you know that? Of course I did. Mashallah. You know, it's technically, uh, it's more correct to say Hanan is, is John. Is it? Because the Hebrew name for John is Hanan. Aha. Uh-huh. And, and, but Yahya is the name that Allah gave Gives. Yahya. Sahih. But Allah describes Yahya as Hanan in the Quran. Hanan amin ladunna. So, uh, Allah. So, yeah. Mashallah. Well, yeah, alhamdulillah, I love your name, mashallah. Zakam Yahya. The reason I don't adopt the Arabic version of John uh-huh. is because English people can't say They can't the say it. I struggled with that my whole life. Throughout school, yeah. that was one of my biggest struggles. Yeah. I, I remember when I first I came I came to the UK when I was about five years old from Denmark, right? So I started from like year one. So of course I'm learning English because I don't know English. So I used to have an assistant teacher. She used to take me out, out of class to learn English. So she would show me pictures of certain images. And she would say, for instance, this is a cucumber, and I have to repeat after her, pronounce it like that, and so on. And then eventually she said to me, what's your name? And I said, Yahya Rabi. And then she said, no, 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 no. Your name is Yahya Rabi. <laughs> you have to pronounce it like that. <laughs> so throughout school, yeah. so people call me Yahya, people call me Yahi, people call me Yahya, people, all sorts of names. Nobody can say Yahya. <laughs> <laughs> it's, no. it's difficult for the English tongue. Of Allah. course. But subhanAllah, your English, mashallah, mm-hmm. is very nice and clear. Mm. I like your accent, very clear, uh-huh. very clear dialect. Is that, that was due to that teacher. She, yeah, she taught me English, you know, like Quran, you know, yeah, when they yeah. teach Tajweed yeah. and yeah. how to pronounce things clearly, that's how I was taught English. MashaAllah. So, you know, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. It's, it's a pleasure thank to you be. for accepting the invitation. Jazakallah. Jazakallah. It's and, a pleasure um, to be And, you know, it's a pleasure to meet you. And, Barakallah. you know, I love people of Quran, people who are, Allah you know, Allah. memorizers of Quran. And I've been speaking to some of the youth uh, recently kind of trying to get to know what's going on, you know, because that was changing a lot. You know, people who were known 20 years ago, the youth don't know these people mm. anymore, the sheikhs or the duat. Yeah. And so I was just kind of asking some of the youth, you know, maybe 18 to 23 year olds, and like, who do you listen to? You know, what, what inspired you to like start practicing Islam? What inspired you to be, you know, at a young age, interested in Islam? And I was really happy to hear that they didn't mention Hyde Park, they didn't mention the debaters, which I'm really happy about. They're mentioning people like yourself, uh, Sheikh Jamal, uh, you know, people who are, who are reciting Quran. And I was just really happy to hear that from the youth. You know, youngsters interested in Islam because of the Quran, because of, yeah. you know, what Islam has to offer. Yeah. You know, and, and I, I was really, really happy of that because... Yeah. Online, you get this kind of perception that they're just interested in debates and this and fitna, and, mm. but it really it isn't the case. You know, we have a good, especially in the UK and especially London, you know, a good uh, amount of youth interested in studying the Dean. Yeah, so I wanted to know a bit about yourself, mm. and you, you know, you said you was you you came from Denmark to the UK yeah. at a young age. So tell us a bit about yourself and. Bye. First of all, the, the, the point that you made is that these young people, they are attracted to Islam due to the, the, those who recite Qur'an and so on. It's the power of the Qur'an. It's nothing that any of us do, subhanAllah. Mm-hmm. And that proves again and again and again that this Qur'an, even when we don't understand it, even when we don't know what it means, it still pierces the hearts. It completely transforms people's lives from one life to a completely different one, subhanAllah. Sure. So that's kalamullah, the seat of Allah, Azza wa Jal. But uh, you asked about me. There's not really much interesting about me. I'm very boring. I came to the UK when I was about five years old. Uh, my family moved over there from Denmark. And uh, alhamdulillah, yani, uh, I came from a practicing household where yani, learning deen and learning Quran and so on was, uh, was extremely important. So from a young age, I was taken to madrasa to learn Quran, memorize Quran. 
to study the deen of Allah Azza wa Jal, but at that stage it was never serious meaning that I didn't have any idea why I was learning this it was mm. just a matter of my parents are taking me there Mashallah. I just have to do it Alhamdulillah and then when I got to around the age of 10 I asked myself I was sitting in all my classes and the teacher was explaining something in Arabic on the board and I thought to myself if only I understood what he was writing in Arabic and I could comprehend it then that would be the ultimate goal that I've achieved it so that motivated me to learn Arabic and, and seek uh, any knowledge a bit so Alhamdulillah there was an institute I started in my area and we started to memorize Quran I started again Memorize the Quran with Tajweed this time. Uh, I started learning Arabic and all the other Islamic sciences, and I did it because this time I loved it. MashaAllah. So Allah Allah. Wa wa ta'ala, he, he placed that love in my heart for it. Yani, Imam Ahmad, Rahimahullah, he was asked, Why did you seek this knowledge? Right? And then he said, Allah made it beloved to me, so I sought it. So it's similar kind of thing. SubhanAllah, if I, when I look back at it now, at the age of 11, I used to wake up extremely early on a weekend and I would travel about an hour to go to a class. No one is forcing me to go. Mashallah. So uh, that was I mean, how it started. You know, it's interesting because, you know, people might look at brothers like yourself and think, oh, they're born with a silver spoon, in the, yeah. meaning, you know, born mm. with good parents, learning Qur'an, yeah. but there was a stage in your life where you chose it for yourself. Of course. You know, there's one thing of putting children through the madrasa, yeah. but, you know, you said the age of 10, 11 years old, yeah. there was just something that, yeah. you know, you made that decision, because we know many people with good parents, mm -hmm. who they've been through the madrasa system, but they've not gone that way. Mm. But sometime later in their life, 15, 16, 20, 30, 40 years old, they, they find that, you know, like everyone has to find Allah. Oh, Even if you're born into a Muslim family, you know, I, I mean, as you know, I'm a convert, but yeah. everyone has to find Allah. You know, and that, that's, very true. that's very true. That's very and that's why it's essential, I believe, that the student, the young person, has to have that desire to learn. He has to be driven. And that's why over the last few years, I've been teaching at a, an institute, the Badr Academy, where we teach Arabic and Islamic sciences. One of the conditions for us to accept a student is that he is the one who's driven, determined to learn. He's not being pushed by parents. When we, when we interview them, if we feel like he's being pressured and pushed by his parents to learn, and he doesn't want to learn, we tell them, you know, you don't have to do this. Mashallah. You can go home, come back when you're ready. Why? Because he won't learn like, he won't like, that, won't yeah. learn like that. Rather, he might dislike this mm. due to being forced. And we don't want people disliking the deen of Allah. And the Quran, the speech of Allah, so on, because you're forcing the person yeah. to, to, to do it, especially when they're adults, 15, 16, you know? That must change the whole kind of structure of the, of this, of the schooling, right? Of, the of, teaching. Co of course. Everyone of course. wants to be there. Everyone's there yeah. because they want to be there. So the whole environment is just a positive, beautiful environment. To the extent that some of the students, they come there just for the environment. <laughs> they say, <laughs> you know, the Saturday, yeah. it's, I look forward to the Saturday because it's my. It's my way out of my life and all the stress that I, my work and all the stuff I'm doing the week. Saturday, I get to relax. I see other brothers, people who are, you know, like me, who are like-minded, who want to learn, who are starting to study deen, etc. It's, it's a beautiful environment. I, myself, as a teacher, one of my favorite days of the week was the Saturday. Because I would be teaching from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. I would only have one hour break. Classes back to back. Sometimes I would forget to eat, but it was so enjoyable. Mashallah, because mashallah. the environment, all the, all the brothers and students and so on so, so you speak about your students um, What type of backgrounds are they from? I mean, they're very different uh, type, yeah. uh, levels of practicing Newly practicing, different levels of knowledge yeah. You know, what, what type of... So the students, alhamdulillah, yeah. the students is very diverse yeah. Meaning that in terms of ethnicities, all different ethnicities And then on top of that, you have different age groups You have people who are in maybe their teens, late teens You have people in their twenties those who are in their 30s, even those who are in their 40s, right? You have students who are at different stages of practicing, those who are fairly new, those who are perhaps you can say intermediate, who've been practicing for a period of time, and those perhaps who you could say they're quite advanced and you know they're, they are now trying to be more studious and more students of knowledge, right? That higher level. You have all those types, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. And to be honest, 
to see students go through that, uh, those stages is one of the perhaps most beautiful things to see. Right? When you see a student progressing and blossoming, perhaps, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it's due to their efforts. You know, after Allah Azza wa Jal, then their efforts that they're putting in and you know, their hard work and their determination. Mm -hmm. And also because the love that they have for what they're learning. Sure. Some of them, subhanAllah, I know certain students, they struggled so much learning. Learning was hard for them. Right, but despite all that, they persevered, Inshallah. and they got so far to the extent that they became teachers. Allah. They never gave up. Inshallah. Right, and myself personally, if I, a lot of people may think that uh, I got to the little that I got to due to finding it easy. I find it extremely difficult when I, when I was learning at the beginning. Memorizing the Quran was hard for me, especially at the beginning stage. Extremely difficult. I struggled so much. And uh, what do you call it? When I even finished my memorization, my, my, my memorization of the Quran, I then uh, and, I, and when I graduated from the institute, our teachers they what they did was that they forced us that we had to learn how to teach. So we had to go through one year and a half of teacher training. Mm. So we would we started off um, assisting the teachers in their classes with the students. And then after a few months, they would hand the class over to us and they would observe us and they would give us feedback and, you know, all the comments that we required in order to, um, to, to improve ourselves. And then uh, after a year, they would hand the class over to us and we would teach. And if we ever needed assistance, we would ask them, right? So that was an extremely uncomfortable scenario for me yeah. because I was not used to speaking in front of people or even addressing people. I was extremely shy. So I found it really difficult. It was one stage was learning, which was difficult. And then I got to another stage, which was now you have to teach, which is also as mm. difficult, perhaps even more difficult, because a lot of pressure is on you. You have to deliver this knowledge in the best mm. manner and try to convey it in a way that all these different minds can comprehend it. It's a big mm. task, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So hands, and you have to keep, try, keep trying yeah. until the person understands and so on. Mm. And be very forbearing and patient and understanding and you can differentiate between yeah. different students and all that stuff. So Alhamdulillah, that was a different stage which was extremely, I think, beneficial. Because what it helped, what it did was it helps you learn first of all, you the knowledge that you learnt, you solidify it by teaching it. As the ulama they will say, Yazidu infaqi minhu wa in The more you give out knowledge, it increases. And the more you hold it back, it decreases. And then on top of that, you learn how to interact with different personalities, people mm. with different, uh, what do you call it, backgrounds, different ways of thinking, and so on. So you, de you develop uh, better people skills. Right? Sure. And you know what comes to mind is that all the prophets and messengers, Allah made them shepherds. Yes. And the reason why they're all shepherds is because in order to be a prophet, you require a lot of forbearance, patience, be able to differentiate between people, uh, be aware of those who are weak and those who are, you know, quite strong. And know all of that. Yeah. You have to be merciful, compassionate, uh, emotionally intelligent. Yeah. Being a shepherd teaches you all of that. Subhanallah. Right. Subhanallah. So then, if you are a shepherd, you definitely lead ummah. Mm -hmm. Right. So perhaps what our teachers were doing is they were making us mini shepherds <laughs> yeah. by putting us in classes, yeah. and so that we can practice what we uh, learned and also to, with their guidance yes, you know, and that's very important that you always have your teachers that you refer back yeah. to and you seek guidance from them mm -hmm. and you seek assistance from them and you consult them with, the, with, with these matters that are important that are going to affect others especially yeah. Subhanallah. Yeah. you know it's i find it amazing when i, when I meet uh, you know i see such a strong uh, culture mm -hmm. of, of youngsters studying in the west mm -hmm. yeah you know you, you don't expect like such a you know, the, the, these pockets of light around London and Birmingham and Manchester mm. and, uh, you know, Netherlands and America, people yeah. studying the Dean in, in mm. such very difficult environments. Yeah. You know, it's not easy to live in London. It's I mean, you, you know, you, you said you went there since you was, you've been there since you were five, mm. but it's a very difficult city to live in. Of course, yeah. It has a lot of challenges, yeah. you know. I'm sure you've had, uh, you know, come across many of these challenges with some of your students and some of your community, you know, uh, people having doubts about the dean, people 
uh, doing sins, people mm. joining gangs, all these type of things. And amongst it, you've got groups of people studying the Dean. Yeah. You know, so I wanted to ask you a bit about your community and and uh, how you are when you know do do people seek your counsel with these? Mm. You know, maybe I'm guessing you have a lot of parents contacting you about their children mm. seeking support some of the challenges that they're facing mm. and maybe uh, you can give us some guidance on you know how you advise uh, mm. living in the west and and, and, mm. and navigating through these challenges of course there are people who are so much better than me who can give mm. and a better answer than myself with the little experience that i have uh, and what's happened is in the west what tends to happen is that you get put in a position that you perhaps uh, didn't seek mm. and what I mean by that is because mm. of all these challenges that we face and people their needs are many uh, they end up going to as any person that they see that has a bit of religiosity that's apparent on them they seek assistance from them so perhaps they are the people because they assume good of us mm. and um, yani, uh, they come to people like myself and those who are, mm. of course, a lot better. And they seek assistance and counsel and this stuff. So there's different types. I tend to deal a lot of time, a lot of time with young people. That's uh, because naturally being a teacher and the, the students, when you build a relationship with students, what tends to happen is that the students, they will um, open up and perhaps uh, seek counsel from you and, and so on. That's, uh, and, and a teacher should be someone who's like that. Because a teacher should not be one who just comes to the classroom, teaches, and that's it. He has no relationship with the student after that. Rather, the ulama of the past, the scholars of the past, they were those who did mulazima to their mashayikh, meaning they stuck with them. They learned from them just by observing them, mm. by being with them, by seeing how they were with their families, by learning all these things. Why? Because deen, religion, is a comprehensive thing. It's not only something that's mm. in the masjid or in the classroom. Rather, it's all of life, Islam. It governs every aspect of our life. So by observing this scholar or this sheikh, what you learn is how to implement that religion in your daily life. Mm. By being in his presence. And that's why a lot of the ulama, they would say that we learned from the silence of our teachers so, more than when they spoke. So right. It mm. wasn't a matter of always narrating a hadith and so on, even though that's extremely important. But also when they're silent and just by their action, what they do, they learn so much. Because the ulama of the past, they had, just like they have changed the narrations in ahadith and, and ijazat and, and asanid in Quran, they also had it in character. Mm -hmm. Imam Ahmad, it is said that he, had, he was the most similar to his teacher in character. And mm -hmm. his teacher was the most similar to his teacher in character. Mm -hmm. And his teacher was the most similar to his teacher in character. And his teacher was the most similar to... Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu in character and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud is the most similar to the Messenger alayhi salatu in character they had a chain back to the Messenger alayhi salatu in character Sorry. just like they had in knowledge Sorry. to the extent that Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullah azza wa jal it was said that thousands of people would attend his classes perhaps over a quarter would just be sitting there not taking any notes observing his character just learning from it Sorry. that's all they were there for Sorry. so a teacher needs to try to imitate these scholars of the past starting with the greatest of the scholars, Muhammad alayhi salatu salam, and those who followed his example, because the students automatically, they're going to imitate you mm. in everything that you do. And that's why you have to be extremely mm. cautious. I remember our mashayikh, they used to say to us that once you are someone who has the responsibility, Allah has given him the responsibility of benefiting others, and perhaps educating others when it comes to their deen, you have a huge task at hand. Meaning that any mistake that you make in the public eye, others are observing you and they're going to imitate you in that and they're going to take that evil perhaps from you. Yes. So you have to be extremely cautious. Now one may say, but isn't that a form of hypocrisy? That you are being very careful in, in, uh, in the public eye, but perhaps at home, you are not careful. Like, it doesn't mean that at home that you do, you're reckless mm. and that's when you're in public mm. that you're careful. It means that at all times you are like that. But when you're in public, you're even more careful yes. because people's, people are observing you and they may interpret things that are okay to be wrong. Mm. Right? And that's why the ulama of the past, and this is something that 
Islam, it encourages highly to have something known as muru'ah. Mm-hmm. And muru'ah is something that's become quite unknown nowadays. It's muru'ah in a nutshell, it is that you have this great character that stops you from doing things that people deem to be shameful. Not haram, mm-hmm. shameful. Yeah, yeah. You stay away from it. Mm-hmm. Right? The ulama of the past will not go anywhere near it. Why? Because what it does is it degrades you. And if it degrades you as an individual, it degrades the knowledge that you possess. Yeah. And then you are damaging the knowledge that you possess. So Imam, Imam Malik, rahmatullah alayhi, he was Imam of Medina, Dar Hijra, and so on. Great scholar. Imam Malik, rahmatullah alayhi, he was in Medina, teaching people. The Khalifa of the time was Harun Rashid. Harun Rashid, he had his sons. He wanted Imam Malik to teach his sons. Mm-hmm. So he sent, he's in Baghdad, Iraq. Mm-hmm. And uh, Imam Malik's in Medina. He sent a letter to Imam Malik saying to him, Ya Imam, I want you to come to Baghdad mm-hmm. to teach my sons. Wait, mm-hmm. That letter got to Imam Malik. This is the Khalifa sent the letter, right? Mm-hmm. Imam Malik read the letter. And then after he read the letter, he wrote a letter back to the Khalifa. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Min Malik ibn Anas ila Harun Rashid. He said, Al-ilmu yu'ta wa la yati. Wassalamu alaikum. Knowledge, you come to it, it does not come to you. Wassalamu alaikum. Why did he respond like that to the Khalifa? If it was anyone else, mm. they perhaps would have said, Khalas, the Khalifa is calling me, I have to go. Mm. Right? The most powerful man in the Islamic State. Mm. Imam Malik, he responded like that because knowledge is above him. I'm never going to degrade knowledge for any individual. Spoiler. Right? And because they had that, يعني, they venerated that knowledge mm. so much, Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, He uplifted that, يعني, He yes. raised them, elevated them with that knowledge. Spoiler. And on top of that, Hanur Rashid, He came to Mecca, He came to Medina, sorry. Spoiler. And He came to with His sons to Medina, and He came to Mesh Nabawi. When He came to Mesh Nabawi, He saw a long queue waiting to ask Yamani questions. Right? Mm. So he thinks I'm the Khalifa, he skipped the queue. He came to the front, Imam Malik told him, hey, you're like everyone else. There's no, this person has a high status uh-huh. and low status when it comes to knowledge. Go to the back of the queue, wait like everyone else. Right? So the person knowledge is a person that the knowledge is evident in everything he does. His speech, his actions, so on. Especially his character. And also the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, they were those who were affected so much by his character. Amr ibn As. Radiallahu anhu, he embraced Islam just before Fath Makkah, right? Just before the conquest of Makkah, which is towards the end of the life of the Prophet. Mm-hmm. He didn't spend many years with the Prophet. Amr ibn As, when he embraced Islam, the Prophet والسلام, he made him the leader of one of the armies. Who is in that army? Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, these great virtuous Sahaba. Mm-hmm. So when he made him the general, Amr ibn As thought the Prophet والسلام, he prefers me over them, he loves me more than them. So what did he do? He went to the Prophet alayhi salatu salam and he directly asked him, Ya Rasulullah, who is the most beloved person to you? Mm. He thought he was going to be the yeah. first one. So the Prophet alayhi salatu salam said, Aisha. He said, Nala, Ya Rasulullah. From the men, he thinks he's going to say him. Mm. He said, her father, Abu Bakr. Who's next? Umar. Who's next? Uthman. And he kept going until Amr said, Ya Rasulullah, stop. But just the fact that Amr asked that yeah. question, it showed that the Messenger alayhi salatu made him feel like he was the most beloved person to him. Yeah. And that's how he made everyone feel. That is the example we have of a teacher, uh, right? To the extent that Amr ibn As, he also says that if you were to ask me how the, describe how the Prophet وسلم, he looks, his face and so on, I would not be able to do so. They said, why? Because when I would be sitting with him, I would not be able to look at him for a long time. I would look down because of the awe mm. that he had, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is the teacher, how the teacher is meant to be the students. Mm. The teacher is one who is concerned about the affairs of his student, like the Messenger Ali mm-hmm. was. Mm-hmm. He saw one day a Sahabi sitting in the masjid. Abu Umama, his name was, radiallahu anhu. And it was not a time of salah. The masjid empty, he's the only one sitting there. And he looked very distressed. So the Prophet وسلم, came to him, sat with him, said, Ya Aba Umama, why is it that you are sitting here in the masjid and not a time of salah? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I've been overwhelmed with debt, and anxiety, and depression, and sadness, and sorrow. The Prophet he sat with him and he comforted him, right? And he consoled him. And then after that, he said to him, Ya Aba Umama, this is the teacher, how the teacher is. I will teach you something. If you say it, Allah will pay off your debt mm. and Allah will get rid of your distress and your anxiety and your grief and so on. So he said, Yeah, what is it, Ya Rasulullah? 
the Messenger alayhi salatu alayhi taught him to say Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-hazin wal-ajz wal-kasar wal-bukhri wal-jubn wa-ghalabati al-dayn wa-qahr-rijal He would say this dua every morning the Messenger alayhi taught him say it every day every morning that I, I, I ask Allah O oh Allah I ask you to I seek refuge in you from al-ham al-ham it is anxiety wal-hazin which is depression and grief wal-ajz being incapable wal-kasar and laziness wal-bukhri miserliness wal-jubn and cowardice وَغَلَبَتِ الدَّيْنِ Being overwhelmed with debt and وَقَهْرِ الرِّجَالِ Being overpowered by other men He taught him this dua But what did he do before he comforted him so as, as a teacher? Right? Emotionally he was present mm-hmm. And at the same time he taught him what he needed He gave him a solution Abu Umama left He implemented that He came back to the Messenger Ali Sallam Happy His face had changed He said, Ya Rasulullah I give you glad tidings Allah Ta'ala paid off my debt And all of my worries and my anxiety and so on All gone That's how he was as a teacher So the teachers now they have that example Because the yeah. Messenger Ali was the best of teachers He would teach even those Who were extremely ignorant Who didn't know how to approach a teacher mm. Because certain teachers may think If the student does not know how to approach me Or they may be rude I'm not going to teach them mm. The Messenger Ali He was approached by Bedouins who were extremely ignorant, who did not know the customs or social norms. So they would come, and the first thing they would do is they would say, Ya Muhammad, addressing the teacher by his name, rude. Yeah. The Messenger Ali it was prohibited to address him by his name. He said, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Nabi, Ya Allah, Ya Abul Qasim. So they would say, Ya Muhammad, Ukhrujina, come out to us. They would demand him to come out to his house, private times. Yeah. Right? Yeah. He would open the door smiling. Because he knows they know they don't know better. Allah says, "Inna ladina yunaduna kimi wara al hujrat akthar la yaqilun." Those who are calling upon you, O Muhammad, from behind your homes, most of them they don't comprehend. They don't know. They don't understand. So what they're doing is Allah excuses them. Then Allah says, "Walau anhum sabaru if they were patient, hatta takhruj alayhim until you came out to them, la kana khayran lahum." That would be better for them. Then Allah says, "Wallahu ghafur rahim." Allah says, "Oh, forgive them, most merciful." Meaning Allah forgave them. Mashallah. Because they don't know better. So the Messenger alayhi salatu salam. He is dealing with them based on because they did not know better, he is teaching them. A Bedouin will come and strangle the Messenger Ali behind and say, and say to him, Give me the wealth from the treasury. Mm. And the Prophet Ali will smile at him and say, Give him what he's asking for. Right? Why? Because if he's giving what he's ask, asking for, then he will listen to what the Messenger Ali has, has to say. A Bedouin will come in and urinate in the corner of the Messenger. The Sahaba rushing to beat him up and stop him. He told him, Leave him, let him finish. Mercy. And then after he finished, he recorded him, he told the Sahaba, pour water over it so that it's clean. And he told him, This is the house of Allah. It's a place of worship, glorifying Allah, exalting Allah, not to do it, acts like this. And then he made, he said, Allahumma rahamni, warham Muhammad, wa la tarham ma'ana ahad. He said, Oh Allah, have mercy upon me and have mercy upon Muhammad alayhi salatu salam and then don't have mercy upon anyone else with us. Why did he say that? Because he's intending the Sahaba who were about to beat him up. Yeah. He, doesn't want Allah, he doesn't want Allah to have mercy upon them. So the Prophet alayhi salatu salam said to him, you, you, you've made something vast, very narrow. The mercy of Allah is vast. So he said, okay, have mercy for them too. Right? That's the best of teachers. Yeah. Even those who were, I mean, nowadays perhaps people who consider people who are lower status than you, the Messenger alayhi salatu salam, he made them feel like they had the highest status in society. Oh. And he taught them, treating them like that. And he, made, he did not only make them feel like that, he believed they were like that. Subhanallah. And that's how the teacher is. The amazing, teacher, amazing. he instills yeah. self-esteem yeah. and confidence in the student. The Sahaba were those who conquered the world with the Quran, the knowledge of the Messenger Ali taught them. Mm-hmm. Why? Because the Messenger Ali instilled this in them through what Allah has revealed the Quran and his sunnah and his character. That's how the teacher is meant to be. Subhanallah. Great advice to teachers, mashallah. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, when we look at the, the, the best teacher, you know, the Prophet no. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, yeah. these, these examples you give, and of course, I've, not, I've heard some of them before, yeah. not heard others, yeah. but even the ones you've heard before, yeah. that every time you every hear, time it's like you know, it's time. just subhanAllah, a reminder of, the, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, and we have the, the greatest Prophet, the greatest leader, you know, and, and what, what we can do to be, to, 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 to kind of inherit that leadership, you know, through through the the scholars, through the through the knowledge of the Quran, mm. you know, yeah. it's, it's Subhanallah. It's a beautiful, beautiful point. Mm. You know, I wanted to ask you um, about um, 
kind of your perspective and and vision for for dawah um, in the West, mm. in London. What do you have in mind? What do you see in the next twenty years? Mm. Um, I, I know a lot of your dawah is focused on the Muslims. Mm. Um, do you do do you do dawah to non-Muslims as well? Um, you know, and what what kind of your vision is for mm. for dawah in, in in the UK? Tell me, tell me. Uh, that's a, uh, mashallah, very big question. And uh, the thing is, when it comes to da'wah, da'wah in Allah Azza wa according to Allah wa Ta'ala, it's something that and every single one of us, especially living in the West, should make an effort in engaging in. Because that is perhaps the only excuse we have being there, right? Mm-hmm. So if we're not engaging in that, we have no reason to be there, right? <laughs> so, uh, of course, Yadi. We'll repeat that word. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> of course. Sure. It's true. So we need to be engaging in that, you know, trying to serve the da'wah to the best of our ability. Every single one of us, Allah wa ta'ala has granted a talent, has granted some ability, strengths. If every single one of us used his strength to serve the deen of Allah wa ta'ala, Allah wa ta'ala would completely transform our state as Muslims. Because Allah said in the Quran, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِنْ تَنْصُرُوا اللَّهَ يَنْصُرُكُمْ وَيُثَبِّتْ أَقْدَامَكُمْ O you who believe, if you aid Allah, if you assist Allah, how do you aid and assist Allah? If you grant victory to Allah, how do you do that? By serving the deen of Allah, by obeying Allah, staying away from the purposes of Allah. Serving the deen of Allah, calling to the deen of Allah, protecting the deen of Allah from those who are trying to attack it and so on. All of that is granting victory to Allah. What is the outcome? Yansurkum, Allah who grant you victory, Allah who aid you, Allah who assist you. And not only that, He will make you firm, He will make your feet firm, being steadfast as well. All of that, it comes to serving the deen of Allah. If we, as Muslims who live in the West, want to safeguard our own religion, because we are also exposed to all the fitna there, it is through serving the deen of Allah. Allah grants you steadfastness. Allah protects you, Allah will be with you, Allah will aid you, Allah Azza wa Jal will assist you and protect you and grant you all of goodness. So that's the first matter. Secondly, that were, يعني, it divides into different categories, of course, and there's different types of da'wah uh, when it comes to those that you're addressing. And the one who's calling to Allah, that he has to be one. When he's calling to Allah, he has to fulfill certain conditions in order to da'wah. And this is something perhaps is, is overlooked sometimes when it's in the West. That we take that step to da'wah, but we don't come with the conditions of da'wah for our da'wah to be effective. Mm. Number one, it is that we have sincerity, ikhlas. Because da'wah is an act of worship. Every act of worship, it requires sincerity. Or oh, Allah Azza will not accept it. Rather, it won't have barakah. Mm. The more sincerity you have, the more barakah the da'wah have. The more sincerity you have, Allah will grant you da'wah a lot of khair. But the less sincerity you have, then this, what you are doing is going to be the evidence against you, Yawm al not for you. You are just increasing and piling up the evidence against you, Allah protects you. Let us that. make it clear as well that when you said, you know, with the sincerity, Allah will yeah. grant it khair, yeah. doesn't it doesn't necessarily mean numbers. famous, or it doesn't numbers, mean numbers, or, or followers, no, or no, likes, no, no. It or doesn't views. Mean that. It's it not that, that. <laughs> you know. da'wah, yeah. and that's what people they yeah. think that da'wah yeah. being successful in da'wah, it yeah. is that you become famous, Sufran. or that you have followers, yes. or that you know your your you know your videos or whatever you produce your mm. books or whatever it reaches everywhere. La, it's mm. not about that. Your man qiyamah prophets will come mm. with not a single follower. Mm. Some prophets will come your man qiyamah with only one follower. Sufran. Some prophets will come with a little bit of people. No, a few people only followed him. Does that mean that they had they lack sincerity? Does that mean that that da'wah didn't have barakah? Does that mean that they weren't successful? Rather, they were successful. But these outcomes are in the hands of Allah Taala. Even our Messenger Ali was told, "Innaka la tahdi man ahdabta, walakin Allah yadi ma yasha." You don't guide those who you love, O Muhammad Ali It is Allah who guides whoever He wishes. Wahu a'lamu bil muhtadin. And Allah Taala is the most knowing of those. What rightly guided? Okay, why you're on this this ayah? Yeah. Because this is the actual ayah I use for my introduction to my podcast. Yeah. So maybe you can uh, uh, recite this for me, and maybe I can use it as an outro. Inshallah. <laughs> 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 this is if it, 
إنك لا تهدي من أحببت ولكن الله يهدي من يشاء وهو أعلم بالمهتدين نعم الله عز وجل يبيض هذه الآية regarding أبو طالب to uncover the message عليه الصلاة والسلام who the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام he really wanted him to embrace the Islam even the last moments he was saying to him, Ya Am, Qul Kalimatan Uha, Julaka behind Allah. Utter a statement, say, La ilaha illallah, and I will defend you, Yom Al Qiyamah, if you say this. Yeah. On the other hand, Abu Jahl is saying to him, Atarrabu am Millati Abdul Muttalib. Are you going to abandon the religion of your father, Abdul Muttalib? And he kept going back and forth, back and forth, until he said, Bal Millati Abdul Muttalib. I choose the religion of Abdul Muttalib. The extremely sad in the Messenger, alayhi mm-hmm. salatu salam, Allah revealed this ayah. To first console the Messenger والسلام, and also yes. teach him the reality that guidance is in the hands of Allah. Yes. And that's why people they misunderstand that the Messenger والسلام, he's a guide, he guides. Right? But his guidance is different to the guidance of Allah. Hidayah is two types Hidayah al Irshad wa Talala and Hidayah al Tawfiq. Allah says in Surah Shura, Wa inna kala tahdi ila Surah al Mustaqim. And you guide to the straight path of Muhammad alayhi salatu salam. And he says in this ayah that we just recited, you do not guide those who you love of Muhammad alayhi yeah. salatu One may think, oh, these two ayahs are contradicting each other. No, there's no contradiction. The guidance that is mentioned in this ayah and the other ayah are two different types of guidance. As for the ayah that says that you guide to the straight path of Muhammad alayhi salatu salam, it means that you show the people this path, you make it clear to them, and the guidance is referred to in the other ayah, it is that Allah he instills that guidance in the hearts, only Allah does that. Mm-hmm. And the Messenger Ali he shows us the path, he mm-hmm. makes it clear to us, he makes the, all the evidence is clear to us, but whether we accept it or not, that's from Allah, that Allah instills it in the hearts. So you know this, this ayah really, it was comforting for myself as well. Mm-hmm. You know, we, you know, you have family members, friends yeah, from before course. Islam, and you know you try to give da'wah, and sometimes you think, oh, you know, what are the magic words? <laughs> you know, yeah. what's the what's the what's the what's the special thing I need? You know, mm-hmm. and it's not like that. You know, like you said, you present the evidences and show them the path. But really, at the end of the day, it's up to Allah, so and you shouldn't despair. Indeed, you know, at the exactly. end of the day, you know the guidance is from Allah, mm-hmm. and they, and you have to leave it at that. One hundred percent. Subhanallah. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very important ayah to know as well. Mm-hmm. You know, especially if you're involved in dawah. One hundred percent. You know, because. Um, Understanding it's Allah who puts that guidance yeah, in, into yeah, the heart. Exactly. Of, of, and that's of, why when you understand these matters, mm. Allah will help you be more sincere in what you're doing. Mm. Right? Because now you understand that the results, they're not up to you. Mm. You do what you can in the best manner mm. with sincerity. And you keep going without despairing, as you said. And you don't give up. You mm. keep trying, you keep trying. Why? Because you are doing this to please Allah mm-hmm. And when you're doing something to please Allah You're not going to stop pleasing Allah mm-hmm. You're going to keep doing it Regardless of the results that you get yeah. right? Because you didn't do it for the results Even though we want results mm-hmm. And we want goodness for the people And we do our best for them to accept it and so on But at the same time If that does not, doesn't happen You don't despair, you keep going So that helps mm-hmm. you attain that sincerity which is extremely difficult and it's something that we constantly need to ask ourselves mm-hmm. and rectify our intentions and question ourselves you know why am i really doing this mm-hmm. that's the first matter that one requires secondly for our da'wah to be one that is correct da'wah we must have knowledge mm-hmm. because if we don't have knowledge or we don't possess knowledge of what we're calling to right then we are going to mislead people mm-hmm. Does that mean that one has to be a scholar to call out to Allah It doesn't mean that Because the Messenger alayhi salatu salam he said بَلِّغُوا anni walaw ayah Convey from me even if it's one verse So that means that That one verse that you know well Convey it If you don't know well, don't convey it Only convey, convey that which you know well mm. right? And this hadith, this hadith the Messenger alayhi salatu salam The ulama they say بَلِّغُوا It is taklif, it is a command what can be And then Anni From me It is tashrif is honor You're conveying from the messenger Alif You're being honored Walau ayah Even if it's a verse It is takhfif The burden has been lightened for you To make da'wah easy for you Right 
So every single Muslim is able to do that. Yeah. We all know at least Surah Al-Fatiha. Yeah. Right? If one ayah of Fatiha you call to it, that's Tawheed according to it. Yeah. According to Allah. Yeah. If we did that, we are du'at in Allah according to Allah Azza wa Jalla. Ilm, knowledge. But of course, as a da'iyah, you shouldn't be uh, yani, happy and satisfied with a little bit of knowledge. You should be, if you're according to Allah, you should seek knowledge. And you should still be learning and excelling in knowledge so that you are calling people in the right manner. Mm. Thirdly, as one who's calling to Allah Azza wa Jalla, you require patience and wisdom. As for patience, if you do not possess patience, then you will not be able to call to Allah Azza wa correctly. Because patience is habsun nafsi fi ma takra li nayli Allah, the ulama they say. It is to restrain the soul within what it dislikes, i.e. to restrain the soul from that which it desires. That goes against what Allah has, has ordained. To attain the pleasure of Allah, that is patience. Mm. So you're restraining yourself. If you don't have that restraint for the sake of Allah, ta'ala, then you are perhaps going to do more wrong than good. Mm. And sometimes we do that wrong under the guise of deen. Yeah. But patience, it is that you do it in the right manner after knowing knowledge. And then what comes with patience is wisdom. Yeah. And wisdom, the ulama, they say, yeah. it is to place everything in the right place. Yeah. And Ibn al-Qayyim, he goes further and he says it is to do the right thing at the right time, in the right place, in the right method. That is wisdom. Yeah. And Allah Ta'ala, he refers to wisdom in the Quran in numerous places. And each time he means something different. And these ayat are telling us that if you possess these matters, you will be a person who is wise. Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, يُؤْتِ الْحِكْمَةَ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَمَنْ يُؤْتَ الْحِكْمَةَ فَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا Allah grants wisdom whoever he wishes. And then Allah says, whoever is granted wisdom, he's granted a lot of goodness. Wisdom here, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and the Sahaba, they say, it is knowing the Qur'an, not knowing the Qur'an, knowing the meaning of the Qur'an. The more you know the Qur'an and you understand the Qur'an, the more wise you'll be. That's what it means. Sure. Secondly, Allah says another ayah in Surah Al-Ahzab, وَذْكُرْنَ مَا يُتْلَى فِي بُيُوتِكُنَّ مِنْ آيَاتِ اللَّهِ وَالْحِكْمَةِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ لَطِيفًا خَبِيرًا Allah says to the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, Remember, O oh wives of the Prophet ﷺ, that which is being recited in your homes from the verses of Allah, i.e. the Qur'an, وَالْحِكْمَةِ and wisdom. Hikmah here is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Mm. So the more you know the sunnah of the Prophet and his seerah, the more wise you'll be because the Prophet was the wise of the wisest human being. Right? Mm -hmm. So you know how to deal with people in the right manner. Wisdom. That is the third matter. So patience and wisdom. Lastly, the fourth matter that you require to have as one who's calling to Allah it is that you know the circumstance of those you're calling to. That you're calling to Allah. Yeah. You need to know their situation. You need to be able to relate to them. You need to be able to understand them. If you're not like that, you won't be able to do be effective in your da'wah. Why? Because Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولِ إِلَّا بِلِسَانِ قَوْمِهِ لِيُبَيِّنَ لَهُ That we have not sent a messenger except with the tongue, i.e. the language of his people, to clarify to them, to call to Allah. Language, what does it necessitate? It doesn't mean that I can only speak the same language as them. Language, mm. it entails culture. Knowing the norms and the customs and you're able to relate to these people. That's what language entails. So all these prophets were those who were sent by Allah to their people, knowing how to relate to his people to call to Allah. The one who's calling to Allah has to be one who's able to do that. Mm. If you fulfill these conditions, you'll be one, inshallah, who can call to Allah effectively. And inshallah, Allah will assist in this da'wah. Mm. But sometimes what happens, a lot of time what happens, especially in the West, these stages we skip them. Yeah. We just take a big jump, we leap to a further stage which we're not ready for. Mm. And then we end up making a lot more mistakes than doing things right. Mm. And that's why if we're not saying يعني, you have to, uh, what do you call it? Uh, we're not saying do not call to Allah Azza wa Jal until you have become a scholar like I mentioned earlier on. Mm. No, no, call to Allah Azza wa Jal, but do it in the right way by, by yes. fitting the necessary conditions mm -hmm. and also consulting those who are more senior than you, mm -hmm. those who are more experienced than you, those who are more knowledgeable than you, so that you learn from the mistakes they made, mm -hmm. right? So that you don't make the same mistakes mm -hmm. and you perhaps 
do a good job inshaAllah ta'ala Because just like we want to perfect every mm. other dunya matter We have to perfect the akhirah matter Which is yeah. deen of Allah Azza wa Which is the most important thing that we possess SubhanAllah yeah. JazakAllah khair This is some good advice for the, the brothers and sisters back in the west You mm. know, and some advice it's advice to myself yeah, Some points, you know, we can think yeah. about And how to give dawah back home in the UK and the yeah. States and in, in Europe you know, we can't, as Muslims, just be living there yeah. and, and, and not share this religion. You of know, if, if we, you know, as, a, as the Prophet said, if, you know, want for your brother what you want for yourself, you know, want for humanity. You know, if, if you truly understood the, the reality of the hereafter, hellfire yeah. and Jannah, you would want it for everybody. 100%. You know, 100%. so hopefully people can take some of these points and start their journey to it's seeking hard. knowledge, perfecting themselves, perfecting yeah. their manners yeah. and teaching what they know as well as Call into Islam, inshallah. Sheikh, you wouldn't be right to get you on and not, not ask for some recitation, you know, because this is your forte, this is, uh, you, know, mm. your, 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 you know, your area of expertise. And, I can tell you I'm not the best. And, <laughs> no, alhamdulillah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we would love to um, get some uh, verses from the Quran with, with, and some explanation now just to finish off, you know, something what people can benefit from. Okay, inshallah. <clears throat> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الذين قالوا ربنا الله ثم استقاموا ثم استقاموا تتنزل عليهم الملائكة تتنزل عليهم الملائكة ألا تخافوا ولا تحزنوا وأبشروا بالجنة التي كنتم توعدون نحن أولياؤكم في الحياة الدنيا وفي الآخرة ولكم فيها ما تشتهي أنفسكم ولكم فيها ما تدعون نزلا من غفور رحيم ومن أحسن قولا من دعا إلى الله وعمل صالحا وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين ولا تستوي الحسنة ولا السيئة ادفع بالتي هي أحسن فإذا الذي بينك وبينه عداوة كأنه ولي حميم وما يلقاها إلا الذين صبروا وما يلقاها إلا ذو حظ عظيم وإما ينزغنك من الشيطان نزغ فاستعذ بالله فاستعذ بالله إنه هو السميع العليم جزاك الله خير جزاك الله خير شيخ بارك الله Thank you for joining us on the podcast. You're very welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be here. Thank you for nice. inviting me. Jazakallah. And I hope we get you on in the future, inshallah. Inshallah, it'll be a pleasure. Barakallah. Jazakallah. I love this. Inna ka la tahdi man ahbabata, 